Drew Lanza fancies himself an optimist. This despite the fact that he got into the venture capital game at a rough time for investors, post-bubble. I'm Brian Fuller, editor-in-chief of EE Times. I was heading down to an industry dinner in the Silicon Valley this week, and I decided to pay Lanza a visit at the Sand Hill Road offices of Morgan Fowler Ventures, one of the older VC firms in the game. Lanza got us some sandwiches, a little coffee, and hooked up with colleague Tom Gibson in Cleveland via a video conference just to make sure that I didn't beat him up too much. And Lanza surprised me. Normally he sports a bow tie, but on this day, as you'll see, he's tieless. So without further delay, E Times TV brings you Drew Lanza Unleashed. So, um, another short term uh, news oriented question um, private equity. That's what we do. We, yeah. We're private, we do equity. <laughs> okay, all, but all those public companies now have been around a long time, big, big companies, Freescale, Philips, um, being taken private. private. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about that. That, that it seemed really hot earlier this year, and now there haven't been as many deals in the last quarter as one would have guessed six months ago. So I alluded to sort of control system theory earlier, and I, I am an electrical engineer. I, it turns out I got my graduate degrees in adaptive systems theory, adaptive control theory. And I just love capitalism. I've only been a venture capitalist for four or five years. And I think the answer to your question is that capitalism always rewires, and it rewires itself very quickly to accommodate glitches and so on and so forth. So I think what we saw was that the public markets didn't value those companies. We saw it on our end because we couldn't take our companies public. right? There's, there's an absolute lack of IPOs now. The public markets don't value what we're doing. So capitalism wires around that. It says, oh, 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 if somebody's not valuing this, then let me value it, right? Right? If the public market doesn't value it, let's take it private. It's spinning off a ton of profit, right? And maybe we can hold on to it some period of time until the market does value it more highly. And I think part of what we're seeing is the market is adapting very, very quickly, right? When people start taking things, I, I don't know, I'd have to look at the stock market. I could guess, I might be wrong, that if I were to look at the price of the stock of companies that potentially could be taken private, I'll bet you'd find they'd gone up, that price of that company, since the other ones went private, mm -hmm. right? Capitalism is a great system. We alluded to this before because it's very Darwinian, right? Right. So we were very concerned that with the lack of IPOs, that would mean that our little companies then could only get out by being bought in an M&A transaction by a Fortune 100 company. And they would sort of hammer us down on price. You know, it really hasn't quite happened. And what's happened in our space is that all these people have floated into sort of late stage financing. They said, well, if IPOs have pulled back, we're going to move into that gap. And so what we're seeing in the venture capital world is lots of venture capital firms, firms like Oak, for instance, uh, coming in and doing late stage funding. There are people on Wall Street doing it. We just talked to a firm in Chicago yesterday. So I think capitalism moves within months to correct any of these imbalances in the system. And I suspect if we were to take what you're looking at right now and tear it down using that sort of an analysis, we'd figure out where those feedback loops were and why things have corrected so quickly. I, and, and I could be wrong. I haven't looked at the stock market. I could be wrong about my thesis. But I guarantee you, we can tear it apart and find those feedback loops. And they react very, very quickly. Yeah. So this week, of course, we saw LSI uh, and, a, and a gear. Why? What was the logic behind that uh, versus some investors coming in and taking both those companies separately private? So, so I do not know. I have not read the teardown on the LSI a gear thing. It's pretty clear that LSI has been searching for the past couple of years for a strategy that would enable them to grow and, and move into the future. Um, it seems pretty clear that, that a gear has a lot of pieces of property that LSI has searched for for some time, especially in terms of sort of intellectual cores to go on silicon. But I do not know why that was a better outcome um, than taking it private. I, I will certainly say there are very big elephants that dance on the floor when companies of that size start to do things. And it often has as much to do with ego uh, or self-interest as it does to do with the larger financial equation. So when you have people who, whose ego says this is the right thing to do and the numbers also work out, things tend to happen. And those are, those are companies that have been known to have egos in the past. <laughs> to say the <laughs> to least. To say the least. Yeah. Sorry, Will. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, last question, and I'll let you get back to profitable business. What um, what electronics goodies are you uh, are you buying for the holidays? 
what electronics goodies am I buying? Well, my son wants, and my son is uh, six, just turned 16, and he wanted for his birthdays in December, he wanted one of the new gaming consoles, but my wife, wife won't let me buy those for the kids. So the kids will get, every two or three years, they get a new um, iBook. So they will get one of the new Intel-powered uh, MacBooks now, they're called. That's what we'll get them. Um, you know, not a lot. I mean, the good news about consumer electronics is it doesn't tend to wear out. What is it about wives and gaming consoles? <laughs> And of course, he just sits on his Mac all the time playing World of Warcraft or whatever the heck yeah. it is. So I'm not quite sure what it is. You know, I think they really do start to drool a lot more when they are actually playing the game console. You know, the, my, my poor wife has to sweep all that up. Um, no, I think I think you get a game console. My wife's view is, and I think this is pretty reasonable. You get a game console or you get a computer, but you don't get both. Because if you had both, then you'd spend all of your time on those things. Um, you know, my my big personal interest is in music, and I have a very large music collection. I've you know. All legal, trust me. Um, and, and one of the things I've started to do is to sort of replicate that for wherever I want to listen to it. And so I've started to sort of wire the house up with all these sort of remote listening devices. So I'm using airports, and I'm also using a device from a company called Slim Devices, which was just acquired. I forget who acquired them. Um, called Slim P3s, which I've owned for a couple of years. So my next thing is it, sort of this Internet of Things, talking about that, is to sort of get my music everywhere. Right, it's not right. just on my iPod. You know, I have thirty thousand songs in my library. It's a lot more than you can put on an iPod. So wherever I am, it's sort of on the network. It's around the house, and that's been my big project for this calendar year. Yeah, well, there's there's more upside to our earlier discussion. Is the is the digital home, the unwiring of the digital home. Right. It's it's not plug and play, and it's not going to be plug and play for the foreseeable future. Right. 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 You, you spend entire weekends trying to. I'm an electrical some of these. engineer, and I like doing this, but I don't. You know. I, it, it's really wonderful as an electrical engineer because you really do wander around and wonder how regular people deal with any of this stuff. Anytime your computer crashes or you know you're trying to wire your home up for audio, I agree with you. I, I, people must go nuts, and we see that reflected in the numbers that that the number of internet appliances in is in less. There are internet appliances in less than one percent of homes out there, and I think that's exactly. I think you have yeah. exactly got the right reason why because you have to babysit these things. Yeah, I have to run a, in order to get all this stuff to work right, I have to run a DHCP server and I have to do some NAT stuff. Yeah, you have to know what all this, you have to get out the RFCs and read them and actually print this stuff. Thanks for lunch. You're welcome. Always a pleasure.